saying my mom likes family traditions is like saying Winnie the Pooh likes honey. A practicing Episcopal, mom was an equal opportunity celebrator. Um, Christmas, Hanukkah, the summer solstice, and mom went all out with appropriate decorations and a perfectly themed meal. Think chicken pot pie with heart-shaped biscuits for Valentine's Day. And while I enjoyed all our traditions, the best were the cakes. Halloween meant devil's food cupcakes. A holly-covered bouche de Noël sat atop the table on December 25th, and a white coconut-covered lamb trotted out after our Easter ham. <laughs> My mom is not crafty. She wasn't about piping the perfect flower or making anatomically correct fondant figures. Martha Stewart would be horrified by the slanting profiles of her cakes. <laughs> But every month, one of them was scratch-made, scented with vanilla and tasting like butter and sugar and an indecipherable flavoring I'm pretty sure was mother love. <laughs> so, can you imagine what a woman who baked for George Washington's birthday would conjure up for her own kids? When my birthday fell on a school day, I'd yank open my lunchbox at the bus stop to find cupcakes with homemade buttercream icing oozing onto the wax paper. For our birthday parties, my mom baked themed cakes Uh, my preteen sleepover meant a four-poster bed cake with slightly crooked licorice stick bedposts and vanilla wafer pillows. <laughs> For the night we celebrated our birthday at home, we each had a signature cake. My older sister chose soccer tort, a thick, dense, chocolatey tort with almonds on top and apricot preserves oozing from the center. And mine was a mouth-wateringly moist yellow cake with caramel frosting, basically panucci fudge thin, just enough to spread, and covered with toasted pecan halves. Our cake tradition was so meaningful because my parents did not normally hover or dote. Uh, there was no term for helicopter parents then, but they definitely would not have qualified. <laughs> Kids were expected to toe the line, get straight A's, and defer to all adults. If mom and dad had a parental motto, it might have been be seen seldom and heard less. <laughs> But on my birthday, I sat at the table, paper crown on my blonde bowl cut hair. Mom carried in the blazing cake, and my father conducted the singing with his butter knife. And I knew I was truly cherished. That's how it felt when my mom taught me to bake, too. Where I was usually sandwiched between two sisters, For that hour or so, she was all mine. Mom pulled up a stool so I could reach the counter and stood next to me at her workspace. We were both wrapped in aprons. Mom with flour on her blue jean thighs where she absentmindedly wiped her hands. She taught me how to separate eggs. Crack it gently on the edge of the bowl, let the clear part run into the bowl and dump that yellow part in the little cup. I don't know how many times my chubby hands slipped releasing shards of eggshell into the batter. But mom was patient and encouraging, evoking the exceptional kindergarten teacher she became once we were grown. As my sisters and I got older, our birthdays were often celebrated away from home. One year, my mom made my signature cake at a campground. Another, on the unpredictable stove of a rented summer cottage. She carried a plastic-swathed panucci frosted cake on the train to my first apartment in New York City. When I was almost 30, I followed my boyfriend from New York to Dallas. After two years, we got engaged, and my mom FedExed branches of bittersweet to our florist. <laughs> The cold-loving berries don't grow in Texas, and she wanted me to have a bit of home at my southern wedding. When she arrived, she arranged the tiny red berries around my shiny white wedding cake. As life moved on, my mother finally gave in to change. It was expensive and impractical to send birthday cake halfway across the country. So when I became a mom, it was time to tie on my baking apron. One of my daughter Isabella's early birthday requests was Elmo. The finished product bore almost no resemblance to the Sesame Street character Not crafty either, <laughs> but she threw her arms around me when she saw it. The summer Isabella was eight, 
She was in a car accident that took the life of her grandmother, my mother-in-law. Isabella's birthday that fall was painful. We were still grieving, but I baked her a cake. But between birthdays, our family's life was disintegrating. Experiencing a death can bring people closer, but it drove my husband and I into separate corners to nurse our own hurts. And what had been small cracks in the cement forming the foundation of our relationship became jagged holes with sharp, dangerous edges. Around the time my daughter hit puberty, my marriage was falling apart. Our team of two parents raising a mostly <laughs> delightful daughter became a constantly shifting power game. Isabella was struggling to grow up and away. I felt off balance and horribly inadequate. For the first time, I began drinking far too much. By the time Isabella was 18, I was still baking her birthday cake, but there was no guarantee I'd be sober to serve it. Ending my night in blackout was becoming its own tradition. I was stuck in a rinse and repeat of drinking, feeling terrible about my drinking, and drinking some more to make it all go away. One night, Isabella came into the garage, my preferred place to drink and smoke cigarettes. Drunk and startled, I stumbled backward, trying to find my balance. She glared at me and spit out, you fucking alcoholic bitch. As she turned and ran out, I sat down hard on the concrete floor. I was going to lose my daughter if I didn't change everything. The next day, I went to my first AA meeting. My first year <laughs> without drinking was like blazing a trail in a wood full of sharp brambles. I had trouble sleeping. I'd wake in a panic, unsure of where or who I was. I moved out of my house and filed for divorce. My daughter graduated high school. I had to borrow pans to make her cake in my tiny, empty new apartment. I was crying while I baked it, trying not to let my nose drip into the frosting. I felt like an outsider at a graduation party, a guest in a house that had been mine for 17 years. I wanted to scream most days. I wanted to drink most days. But erasing Isabella's words was a force that drove me. Slowly, I made new friends, I got a second job to pay my bills, and began piecing together a new life. Slowly, 365 one days went by. Now, my AA group makes a big deal out of sober birthdays. We decorate, we give out flowers and cards, and there's always some kind of cake. It's usually terrible. <laughs> and they get it from Kroger, and it has all that chemically sickly sweet hallmark of a store-bought cake. The inscription, a generic happy birthday in labored white script. For my first celebration, I nervously asked Isabella, and she agreed to come. Unlike a belly button birthday, that sober anniversary was something I had earned, not by myself, but for myself. And seeing Isabella smile at me made it a sweet celebration indeed. I'm looking forward to the day I get to bake my grandchild an extraordinary birthday cake. It stops my breath to think that one day my mom won't be alive to share it, but I know her cake tradition must be kept alive. And to keep me alive, I plan to keep celebrating my sobriety every year. There may be different friends to celebrate with me. Maybe one day I'll have a new partner, but I do know there's something I will always insist on. There must be cake. <clears throat>